Everybody, yeah. Rock your body, yeah. Everybody, rock your body right. It's always sunny and Hollywood is back. Going All back right. to 2002. Yes. Indeed. Uh, we are your usual suspects. My name is Patrick, and the other two are... I am Lugia. And I am Red. Yeah, we're Drummers. kicking it. We're kicking it like it's 2002. I was though. literally an infant. Random question: Do you guys have any memories of 2002? Not really. No. no. My memories start at 2003. Because I, I remember, think... I remember being like, actually, I think it starts like 2004. Because I remember being like three and a half was like my earliest memory. So like, I'd say like, right at the start of 2004 is when my memory started. The only thing I really remember about 2002, but is uh, when I saw Lilo and Stitch in theaters. But here's the thing: I don't know if that was a dream or not. What Pixar movie came out? Uh, 2000. No Pixar. No Pixar movie came out in 2002. Yeah, but what movie, Pixar movie came out in 2003? Finding Nemo. Okay, I, I, yeah, 2003 is my first memory because Finding Nemo was, I, that was like the seeing that movie in theaters is one of the first like things i saw i think i saw that a couple of years later in like 2005 first pixar movie i saw in theaters was the incredibles it had to be uh yeah for me i'm pretty sure it was finding nemo uh and then the incredibles and cars i remember seeing all those in theaters and stuff it's weird and the first really... the first movie i remember seeing in theaters if it wasn't lilo and stitch then the earliest i remember was shrek 2 yeah, I, I definitely remember movies, seeing a bunch of movies uh, in theaters 2004. Like, I remember seeing uh, Spider-Man 2, Incredibles, a Spongebob movie. Uh... I remember when the Spongebob movie came out, my parents wouldn't let me see it for some reason. It's I mean, a talking it sponge. It... This isn't realistic. I mean, I, I was able to watch Spongebob when I was younger. And even then, like, when the movie came out on DVD, I've, I've seen it multiple times. But for some reason, in the movie theater, they said no. Huh. What was it rated? PG? Yeah. It's very Which is like weird. the standard, standard review for back then for yes. animated kids' movies. You know, I do find the fact uh, that this uh, movie released in um, 2002, which was like the only year Pixar didn't release a movie in the 2000s, kind of like interesting on a meta sense. It's like they're filling in the blank, <laughs> they're filling in the gap. Yeah, 2001, then no 2002 but then three four you're 20 years late to the party but all right i guess you could fix that mistake pixar the next movie has to be uh, 2005 i guess because that's the next gap oh well, we'll figure out when elemental gets here when did what does inside out like take place in 2016 or whatever um in terms of if we're talking about the pixar theory i don't know no, i want to say it just takes yeah, place in but... present day I was like, yeah, okay. I can't really think like I can't really think of any Pixar movies other than Turning Red and Wally -E that really specify the year they were set. I mean, The Incredibles took place in the '60s. Oh yeah, yeah, and The Incredibles. But I mean, those are the only three or four, I guess that that really. I feel like Ratatouille. If like you, I paid attention, I could probably like pin the the time period because I feel like there might be some details in like the background. But like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, we, should we actually guess, get into the movie? Guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, we are just, five minutes in and we have not even said the name of this movie. No, I said I said Turning Red. Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Anyway, um, I just want to do just a brief uh, little um, you know, rest in peace, uh, Coolio. Uh, you know, we usually talk about you know celebrity deaths when they come. So, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, some of Coolio's songs. His most famous is probably a Gangsters Paradise, which ah uh, yes, yeah. the parody of yes, the parody yes. of Weird Al's Amish Paradise. Yeah, and my favorite um, song from the Sonic movie. <laughs> All right, I forgot that was a trailer song too. But yeah, um, it is like a genuinely like good song though. People meme mm -hmm. on it now, but like um, it's well written. So uh, you know, it's a pretty like effective uh, piece of art. So you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, rest in peace, Coolio. Uh, you will be missed. Anyway, yeah, let's just uh, hop into the movie, I guess. All right, turning red. This is Pixar's 25th feature film, and quite a noteworthy one, too, as this is not only their first film to be directed solely by a woman, but also their first film directed by a woman of color, and the first film they have with an all-female production team. So, yeah, quite progressive. 
But speaking of which, to talk about the film's director, Domi Shi, she had previously worked as a storyboard artist on films like Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, The Incredibles 2, and Toy Story 4. And she made her directorial debut with the Oscar-winning short film, Bao. But when it comes to Turning Red, that came into the picture around the time Bao was completed in late 2017. Pixar offered Domi Shi to pitch three movie ideas, and all the ideas she pitched were coming-of-age stories. But the idea of Turning Red most intrigued the studio, since of Shi's pitches, it was the most personal to her. And because she pitched the, the whole movie as a girl going through magical puberty. They said, yes, that's the one. Also, Turning Red had the shortest production time of any Pixar film, going from pitch to release in just a little over four years. Wow. I don't really have a whole bunch about this movie, uh, but one fun fact I found kind of interesting is that, um, well, as we said, this movie is set in 2002. Do you guys know why it's set in 2002? Uh, boy bands? Well, yeah, boy bands. It's uh, a central part of the plot. Or maybe, was it because um, like she was uh, that age in 2002? So she's she, just was that age in 2000. she was that age in 2002, but she said there's another bigger reason why and that is because this movie doesn't have any social media ah okay if this movie had like instagram and snapchat then the whole secret secrecy of the panda it would fall apart yeah she said let's set it let's set it in a time where social media wasn't really as prominent yeah i'm guessing uh when did myspace get invented uh 2007 eight i don't know facebook was 2004 yeah, but like MySpace was oh, MySpace was two thousand three. Okay, so literally like <laughs> just right, right below just, the buzzer. Damn, that just really before, made it. <laughs> just yeah. made it. Right yeah. before social media became like a real thing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, Turning Red was initially planned to be released theatrically, but Disney shifted it to a Disney Plus exclusive due to Omicron cases rising in the beginning of the year. Yeah. And this Omicron made turning red the ID. this made turning red the third Pixar film in a row to be sent directly to the streamer as a result. And I'm gonna be real, I don't quite get why Disney kept doing this. Okay, I get it for Soul. I get it for Soul, and to some extent, Luca. Yeah, that was like much I, more in the thick of the pandemic. But uh, but this yeah. was I, I this find was, it odd that like Lightyear was the one that they decided to let go to theater and not. This, but... <laughs> Yeah, because oh. Lightyear, Lightyear, here's the thing. Lightyear was released in the middle of, like, a really crowded market. It Right between Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World 3. Turning Red came out when there were no other fam- The biggest competition it had was the Batman. Yeah, and, like, I'm, I'm, it's a completely different audience. Yeah. I imagine no, this I, movie I really- I imagine this movie probably would have done fine. I don't know, I have no evidence to back that up, other than the Batman was the only other movie that was really out. I don't want to see this Tanuki. I want to see the fucking Batman. Yeah, I don't know why, though. That's so weird. Yeah, especially since, like, last year with a bunch of, with Disney, with a bunch of their movies, they had them on Disney Plus, but they also released them in theaters. And if you wanted to watch it at home, you had to pay $30. But with Pixar films, it's just exclusively on Disney Plus for free, which I mean, great that it's free, but why can't I also get the option to see it on the big screen? I don't know. I don't know. That just, that just always confused me. Are theaters dying yeah. still? No. 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 I mean, uh, I'd say they've been. Yeah, they they've mostly recovered. I mean, much. if Minions Two and Top Gun Maverick are anything to go by, no. Yeah, Top Gun Maverick is straight up like the. Fifth it's the biggest movie, movie of the year of so time. far. Okay. Yeah, be like even like just historically, like it's like the fifth like highest, I think, in the domestic market or something. I know it's Paramount's biggest movie worldwide. Surpassed Titanic for that. That's impressive. People really want to see Tom Cruise fly planes. Anyway, no uh, enough of the uh, theatrical release tangent. Uh, although the film didn't get released theatrically, it did actually manage to set a record. Apparently, it was the largest premiere of any Disney Plus original on its weekend release, drawing in 2.5 million viewers in the U.S. So, little success. More than, little success. More than Encanto? Or does Encanto not count because uh, it was in theaters? I get because again Disney Plus original. All right, fair enough. As in exclusivity, Turning Red was. I mean, Encanto was in theaters. Yeah, briefly, but it was. Uh, but right. uh, 
No, but I mean, despite despite that, it received positive reviews, albeit uh, some divisive reviews. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Shall we actually get into the nitty gritty? Let's do it. Sure. All right, here we go. Turning Red is about Mei Lin Lee, a Chinese-Canadian girl with a good social life, high academic remarks, and a loyal practice in filial piety. But when I'm she gonna... turns 13 years old... What? I was expecting you to just straight up just repeat the opening monologue. <laughs> no, I'm not lazy like that. <laughs> anyway, when she turns 13 years old, she discovers that whenever her emotions run high, she turns into a giant fluffy red panda. So now she faces a struggle as she tries to maintain loyalty to her mother while at the same time developing a new sense of independence. And not making things any easier is the fact that her favorite boy band is coming to perform in Toronto. So we've briefly talked about this a while back when it first released. Me and Red saw it, but Lukia, you did not. So I'm very curious, what did you think of this movie? Okay, so going in knowing that uh, this movie was kind of a mixed bag from general audiences. Uh, I came out actually kind of liking it. It's not perfect. I do think there are some things that could have been done better. I think the general message and themes of the movie are great. Like, um, should we get into that, actually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, so... so... Um, I'm not sure if you remember uh, what our review is about. I think we, we kind of had a similar idea where it was... a. Uh... We liked it overall, but, you know, we were a little bit, you know, mixed. It wasn't perfect, but, you know. It's not perfect, but I still really like this. Yeah. yeah. It's it, not um, a top I'd, favorite Pixar movie, but. I consider this movie um a grower, as in, like, I, um, like, even, like, initially, I was, like, uh, a bit, like. Uh, lukewarm? I was a bit lukewarm, but, like, my second go around, I liked it a bit more. And then now I just, like, straight up just like it. Like, it, you know, it's flawed, but, you know. And my issues haven't, like, gone away, but just the parts I like, I just like more. I liked this movie when I first saw it. Uh, whenever I rewatch it, I do notice some things that I think could have been a bit more tight, but I still really like it. Yeah, I think um, the few themes that this movie has with uh, friends versus family, trying to find yourself as a teenager, the struggles of growing up as a teenage girl, um, I think those are really well done in this movie. Like, I... I would not expect a Pixar movie to, like, tackle heavy things like that. I think that's one of the benefits of having a purely female production uh, team work on this. What did you guys think of the themes? It was interesting, um, mostly because, like, um, okay, let, let me just, like, I guess sort of uh, say elephant room. It effectively has the same themes as um, Encanto, but from taken from, like, a completely different uh, perspective, almost. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was... Um, Interesting. Even um, I'm not sure if you guys seen uh, Everything Ever All at Once, which no, is a I have not relatively popular movie, but it also has like very similar themes. So I'm like, just thinking like a bunch of like um pretty high profile movies all coming around around the same time, um with similar themings, and I was like, it's interesting how each one kind of like approaches it differently. I'm not sure which one's my favorite. I kind of liked all three of these movies like about the same. As in, uh, there's a lot of things I like about them, and also there's a lot of things that don't. Like, straight up in my 2002 ranking, I have everything ever all at once and turning red, like, right next to each other because I'm, I'm just, I, I can't decide. They're, they're effectively, like, two sides of the same coin to me. But, um... This is probably my favorite movie I've seen this year so far, actually. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of movies this year, so it's, like, number 13. But the thing is, most of the movies I've seen this year have been good. So, like, 13 is, like, a high, <laughs> is not a low ranking. I want to make that clear. The curiosity, uh, I, what, what's, out of curiosity, what's the worst movie you've seen this year? The Cashmere Files. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I hadn't even it. heard of it. It's this Indian movie my parents made me watch. And uh, it's funny, the best movie I've seen this year is also an Indian movie. R -R -R. Um, like, uh, Yeah. But The uh, Cashmere Files, it is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I never want to see it. I, you guys should not see it. Just straight up. Do not check it out of curiosity. It is disgusting. It is like... um. Again, I've never even I've heard of it. And I'll be perfectly I honest, I completely forgot don't what the title it. was. Don't fucking watch it. Just don't fucking watch it. Don't fucking Won't. watch it. That movie fucking traumatized me. Like, don't fucking watch it. All right. Um, second worst I saw was a gray man. I also gave that a one out of ten. So yeah. Uh, turning red. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so turning red. The main thing I want to say is this movie is uh has a very um narrow audience, and I think that I, mo I think most of the controversy is just rooted in the fact that uh 
it it does have a very specific audience and some people have just kind of had a difficulty putting their sort of mind space in that audience so we are both like men in our early 20s this one is clearly aimed at you know middle school girls and uh you know despite that i still enjoyed it but i can you know understand why you know there's probably a disconnect with uh some other people and that's the thing i've noticed that a lot of the most critical reviews are coming from men and i mean the three of us are men so i guess we're adding in but i mean we're not we're not highly critical of this movie at least so far no, i was based able to our, understand our, what this movie was trying to say yeah, yeah based on our attitudes we're the pretty positive that, towards this the thing that annoys me at this movie had nothing to do with like uh the gender because i just found that interesting the only things that annoy me is just the fact that like it's uh it is aimed at middle schoolers and um I'm just I'm just not a middle schooler, so the humor is like just is really hit or miss for me because like there's some you know jokes that are just you know like timeless it works with any age. And then there's some where I'm like I know I would have found this funnier if I was you know in middle school, but it I just because I'm not anymore. It's just like uh, it's just not funny. Like that's I think the real I think the real highlight of the comedy is the facial expressions. Yeah. Yes. I think the I animation say, in this movie is really well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know some people had issues with the animation, but I found it really charming, like in in a twofold way, because um, I kind of like the almost like playset, almost look this thing kind of had, because like it's a very it's pink move. Despite out. it, despite it being called turning red, it's very pink. Pink yeah. is a like, tint of red, so it's not it all, far it off from the like, truth. Like, it hey, almost looks like a little like half right. <laughs> when things like zoomed out, like I, I was thinking of like I don't know, like. It almost looked like like models almost when like uh, anytime like you saw like things from like a like a distance um like I don't know playtime or that movie yeah I, yeah movie I noticed that too and um like I don't know I remember some people were dissing the art style and honestly it's just reminded me of when um, people were upset about the Link's Awakening like art style I'm like nah the art style is nice like come on I guess it's what people didn't have in mind for a movie like this anyway yeah I mean Actually, it's just like it's a very uh. Uh, the art style is very much something that uh, you would expect in 2D, but in 3D, I think some people think like as a little bit of an awkward translation, and I think it was ultimately effective. But I, I understand why some people would feel according it's a to behind the scenes. According to behind the scenes, basically what they wanted to do with the style was they wanted to do what they called an East meets West. They wanted it to have the texture of Western animation, but the expression of Eastern animation. Yeah, and I'll say it's. It's kind of hit or miss because here's the thing: I, I do have some issues with like the arts. There are like some moments where I felt like things looked like a little stiff. Um, like overall, I'm I'm positive on it, but like there there are hiccups in the animation. And uh, but what I find is like interesting. Um, the eyes I think are the obvious like uh, anime <laughs> influence. Yeah. Uh, but what I find movie. really interesting about the style of this movie is that although this is a movie about Chinese characters and Chinese themes. The art style takes a lot of influence from Japanese media. Here's the thing. I don't think it takes, like, that much. I think this movie is trying to gun for, like, a Sailor Moon kind of style because um, it has, like, a similar uh, palette almost, and there's the directly homage Sailor Moon. Yeah, but, I like, know. The art style is just it's very much Western. Like, people are probably going to hate this comparison. This reminds me of, like, Steven Universe, where, like, Steven Universe had, like, an anime influence to it, but ultimately, like, the look, it was very clear, like Western. This movie has like the same art style, Steven Universe, to me. Uh, a bit more consistent. I know most of the big complaint about Steven Universe is just kind of how, uh, what's the word, um, inconsistent it was. But uh, I don't know. I, I'd say it's uh, this one did a good job, you know, in every department. But uh, I mean, yeah, like, um, I understand the, the way that the way they lock up the panda in the necklace. <laughs> it's like it's like Pokemon where they're capturing it. And also yeah. the end the ending stadium battle is basically a Bowser fight. <laughs> yeah. Well uh, Bowser's fury all like, over again. It's like I don't I don't, know, I don't know I don't know what the I don't know what the upcoming Mario movie is gonna have in store, but I am expecting a Bowser fight on par with the ending stadium fight in this movie. My standards have been set. I am sorry. I'm expecting them to have a musical number just because I don't know why I feel like they're gonna incorporate a pop song in the Mario movie. And I, I thought the ending of this movie, the ending of this movie was like my favorite part. Actually, wait, wait, wait. I just realized something. Yeah. The color scheme. You got the red main character, the green best friend, and then like that one girl that's basically just Wario. Like this is a Mario movie. <laughs> yeah. Power up. One of them wears purple. Waluigi. I, 
Yeah, now, I remember. She, I remember when I saw this. Got a pa- and, and she got and she got a power up. Like this whole movie is about her essentially just getting like this the, the, like, the, the, the super Tanuki mushroom. Mar- this is Tanuki Mario the movie, basically. Don't tell Peta. Yeah. But no, I remember when I I first saw this movie. I was watching it with a friend of mine, and at the end, I'm like, "This is basically a Mario movie. This is basically yeah. the Mario movie." <laughs> yeah. So um, into I guess just my general like uh, compliments. I thought. The friendship dynamic that's rooted in the movie was like the strongest part. Um, mm-hmm. It's also nice to see a group of girl best friends that are supportive of each other and not like fighting. I think it's like that. That's that you're rare, but maybe it's just because like I I do watch, you know, Sailor Moon and and stuff like that, and like a, like just the, the things that this movie is clearly influenced by. I've seen, and you know, they're all friends there. But yeah, I guess you know, like um, when you think of like the quintessential uh girl movie of the 2000s it is you know mean girls mean girls yeah mm-hmm. but no um, like Nate's friends are very supportive of her and it was her idea to decide to use the panda to, to make money it wasn't her friend's idea yeah, more even or less the, the mother, confrontations even, between even her and her the mom mother, even Since though the mother is like i don't like the influence like these girls are having yeah. on you even though it was all her idea yeah speaking of which uh so we did mention um mean girls uh, what I find interesting is uh, I do think this movie has a visual and even almost similar humor to Mean Girls, despite the fact that, you know, um, tone-wise and theme-wise, it's, like, nothing alike. But, like, I don't know, maybe just, like, in an attempt to capture the 2000s and kind of just indirectly sort of capture a little bit of the Mean Girls style just because, you know, that, that's a 2004 movie. Since we're just getting the year part, because I, I'm going to say the year is, like, a very, like, big element of it on, like, a... Not just like a like a thematic level, but like a plot level, and even like on a visual level, it very much feels like it's trying to capture two thousands. But I feel like it's very much like filtered through modern lens. Like I feel like this is a like a Zoomer's interpretation of the early two thousands, or I guess like a modern kid's interpretation of the early two thousands. Like someone that saw Mean Girls and like Powerpuff Girls and listened to Backstreet music, and like they saw some of their music videos, and maybe they have a few hazy memories and are just filling in the blanks with modern culture, but like. It definitely feels like sort of a blend of like modern teen stuff with 2000s teen stuff. And I thought that it gave it like a, a kind of a univer- an interesting vibe because it feels like a sort of combination of both eras. Also, oh yeah, uh, Lugia, a bit of an inside joke. There's a Toledo surprise in this movie. Oh shit, I missed <laughs> that. Spo- turning red spoilers without context. Toledo surprise! Um, all you, all you drowsy chaperone fans are rolling in the aisles. I guarantee it. I mentioned the Powerpuff Girls. You got any Powerpuff Girl vibes in here? Because I don't know. A little I'm... bit. A little bit. Yeah. Actually, though, I was, I was, uh, in terms of the general plot, I was reminded of a Goofy movie because you know the what? parent dynamic yes, and parent dynamic. Yeah. They want the the kid wants to go to a concert and also achieve independence. I mean, yeah, I, uh, Domi, yeah, she yeah, did say that a Goofy movie. movie was an influence for this. But... That is like the quintessential like '90s kids movie, and this is like ultimately a 2000s. So it's it's really like even like the the elements were like it's very much representative of like the time period it takes place in. That's kind of like shared here. I wonder if that's why like they, that that's another reason why they try to root it into a time period because like the time period was so you know influential with the. A goofy movie. I mean, a goofy movie like, like people like people get on this for like not being very relatable, but a goofy movie treads similar territory to this. Granted, I mean, anyway, father father son relationships and mother daughter relationships are very different, but you know, similar similar aspects are treaded. Like again, the son yeah. wanting to achieve his independence, him getting embarrassed. Okay, but uh, trying, trying to trying mentioned... to connect with the father. Since you mentioned a goofy movie, I feel like I have to mention this because I mentioned it uh, both the times we talked about Turning Red before, but um, The Mitchells versus The Machines. Okay. Here we go again. This movie, I feel like it's like almost like a perfect companion piece. But now, since you mentioned goofy movie, it's like a perfect, like, that's like a triple feature because like a goofy movie and then you transition to like this road comedy about the father-daughter relationship and then this uh, movie about a mother-daughter relationship, all with effectively the same themes about how them just kind of like not like really connecting um and uh both have this weird weird element where like i really like the story but for some reason the jokes are just so hit or miss where like i'm cringing half the time at the jokes but the other time like i'm like this is great uh, i guess I feel like I, I guess here i feel like here the cringe 
works. Like, yeah, here's the thing: out of compared to Mitchell versus the Machines, I do like this more because. Let's be real. Teenage, year, teenage years, teenage years are very cringy. Yeah, here's the thing: with Turning Red, the cringe is like very specific to middle school, which is mm-hmm. why I'm okay with the cringe here because, like, this is the exact kind of middle school cringe. Whereas, is like the Mitchells versus the Machines. That's a very like internet rooted cringe, and it doesn't feel like that's middle school. It feels like that was the internet a few years ago, and that's like a very different vibe. Where like this so, kind of taps into the more universal cr- middle so school. In cringe, a weird way, in a weird way. That specific middle school cringe. So basically, in a weird way, middle school cringe is weirdly timeless. Yes and no, because here's the thing. Here's the thing <laughs> with Mitchell's versus the machines and everything ever all at once. As I mentioned, both both of those that when I think think that of the middle school cringe in there is like in Mitchell's versus the machines, everything everyone else. It's not middle school cringe. It is specifically 2012 cringe, which is different. Mm. I happen to be middle school in 2012, but like. That cringe is like specifically like just they're just playing stuff from 2000 from 2012 internet culture and expecting it to still land now versus here it's like it knows it's cringe so like I'm saying turning red I think nailed the cringe thing like a, just a bit more because it's it's tapping into the universal middle school cringe where I think Mitchell versus the machine everything everyone else just incidentally is tapping into middle school cringe like it's it's not trying to be middle school cringe but it's accidentally just reminding me of middle school cringe versus this one is in, it's intentionally trying to be middle school cringe well to switch gears but still in a s- similar realm can we talk about the controversy for the for all second? right yeah let's do it I'm okay so what controversy what, you like you really mean the controversy about how this movie deals with menstruation yeah, listen. Or at least parallels it. Listen, here's my take on it. Um, mm-hmm. Have you guys seen Steven Universe? Uh, a few episodes. Yeah, I've only seen a couple okay. episodes from the first season, and that was it. There, there was a similar controversy with uh, how fusion is kind of like an ab- is kind of an abstract metaphor, and one of the interpretations of the metaphor is sex, and people thought eh, the you know, things got a bit muddy there. What I'm saying is that it's not a one to one allegory; it's an abstract metaphor. Chill. It's not like it's not that complicated. Y'all are just like taking the worst possible extreme. And even if it is that extreme, in this specific case, it's not even like that big a deal. So I think the yeah. controversy here specifically is stupid. Like Steam Universe, that one made a little bit more sense, but that one was also stupid because it's a it's abstract. It's like people that being that like when they talk about Zootopia, you know, they're like, oh, well, the predators actually are dangerous. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, you understand, like, there's a level of abstraction when it comes to this art. If it was a one-to-one thing, what's the point of making it the cartoon? Just make it the actual yeah, thing. I, I would agree. I think the controversy here is blown out of proportion. Because here's the thing. They, they bring up pads, yes. They show a box of pads. But they never specify what exactly they're for. Or what no, they, actually, they're not, the thing. They're not I'm teaching like kids they, they how straight, to use straight, it. Straight, they straight up mention menstruation because that's just what the parent assumes it is. Then they realize it's something else. So, like, really, it's not like a, a menstruation metaphor. They just make a joke about it. Exactly. And, then and even then, they it's make, not even they part of the main up, plot. They bring it up three times, and then that's it. Yeah, and I guess just, like, red, I guess, is, like, sort of an evocative color. But, like, that's just it's just a red panda. Like, it's just a coincidence there. So I, I think part of the reason for the freakout is less the movie itself and more the industry because let's be this movie is rated pg and let's be real pg kind of means jack shit nowadays yeah like parents assume pg is the same as g basically and i mean this this actually leads to a question i want to ask you guys were your parents very strict about what you watched when you were younger they weren't too strict in my case basically they just followed like the number system, PG thirteen. You gotta watch. You gotta be thirteen to watch it. Rated R. Wait until you're seventeen. It, they weren't strict about it. Like they'd still take me to PG movies no matter what age I was. And basically, just follow like sort of the age restriction things. But there's there would be like a couple like you know exceptions. Sometimes they'd make like a judgment call where they'd be like, I think I saw like the Matrix on TV, and they're like, all right, like the Matrix is technically rated R, but there's nothing really in the Matrix that warrants an R rating. You know, same with like, um, like the Simpsons. They would uh, they let me watch the Simpsons. Sometimes there'd be a few episodes that they'd be like, okay, maybe don't, don't watch this one. But like, you know, they'd allow that. 
I think the only real restriction was just like, you know, I wasn't allowed to watch Family Guy. I wasn't allowed to watch South Park. I wasn't allowed to watch any R-rated movies without them for prior, you know, authorizing. Or like, yeah, same here. My parents, other than like adult animated shows and R-rated movies, they were they were pretty chill. So again, uh, going back to what I said in the Pleasantville episode, I'm kind of surprised at some of the stuff they did let me watch because I mean, like I said, when I was a kid, they let me watch Pleasantville. But as I got older, I realized certain things about it that I'm like, oh. Okay. Like, I told you guys my interpretation of the scene where the mother's yes. in the bathtub. I remember Years that. later, I'm like, oh, this is something completely different. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any, like, oddly inappropriate movies that my parents let me watch, but I can't really think of any. Um, I don't know. There's nothing in here that I don't, I don't think, like, middle schoolers couldn't handle. Because, like, quite frankly, everyone's, like, a bit restrictive on middle school, high school content and stuff. Um, you guys remember middle school. That was like the most offensive, edgy time of our life. Like I, st- high school was less. I heard less offensive shit in high school than I did in middle school. Like high school people mellowed out, but middle school people, I just discovered what edge was, and it just went full force. Anything else? Also, also, yeah. Random question: Did you guys know anybody with a tamagotchi? Um. Yeah. Dude. I had a tamagotchi. You did? Yeah. I don't remember you having a tamagotchi. I mean, I just, like, I didn't, like, take it to school or anything, but, like, I had one. Okay, that's I why. Know. I mean, I, I think I did take it to school, like, a few times. But it was mostly just, like, something that's just kind of, like, you know, knick-knack. I just would have played sometimes. I did not yeah. have a Tamagotchi. It was all about Webkins, baby. <laughs> Yo, yeah, that was the no, shit. I mean, Neopets? Webkins, what? Oh, yeah. Never I mean, had a Neopets, I, I but Webkins Neopets, was, like, the I got thing. into Webkins, and um, I got into Toontown, if you guys remember that. That I have not played. Remember the ads for Toontown where these kids would just throw pies at people? They, they should bring Toontown back, honestly. I don't know. Club Penguin, Toontown, those are all Disney, like, those are all Disney-made stuff. I think Toontown got a revival. Fans revived it, though. It's yeah. It's like, uh, they basically just, like, re- it's kind of like that, um... The Club Fusion Penguin Fall, thing? It's kind of like the Fusion Fall revival and the Club Penguin revival where fans basically mm-hmm. just, like, rebuilt the game. We went on a lot of tangents this episode. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah. already talked about this movie before. Well, you guys talked about this movie. Yeah. Like, I'm the only one here with a new experience. Yeah, but um, I will we, say... Do we have anything else to add? Aside from that, I really like the themes of this being about a teenage girl trying to find herself, and I think they do that really well. Um, I do have to agree that the humor is pretty hit or miss. Actually, there's one thing I want to bring up. So, uh, obviously, this is the first Disney movie directed uh, solely by a woman, but there is the, obviously, we should probably mention the last one that was directed, at least in part, by a woman, uh, Brave, which uh, a woman uh, did most of the pre-production and stuff, but um, once the production actually started kind of going, she eventually got kind of phased out. Um, I do just want to find it interesting because I do think, like, the, the initial dynamic in Turning Red and with, like, Brave is kind of like, there's a similar thing with just, like, the mother-daughter, like, conflict. I just found it interesting that, like, their second sort of crack at this, they also did, like, a mother-daughter thing, and they even had, like, eight characters turning into, like, a magical beast. It's just, they, they just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Reaction with it. So it was, like, it was kind of almost like, like, it's, like them trying Brave again, and uh, I think brave they did it more successfully. Um, although I do think that there was just so much potential with Brave, so, like, I still kind of wish we got, like, you know the actual one but yeah it's funny because um, like i I, th- I think of this movie as like a cross between brave and inside out which is funny to me because when they announced inside out 2 i'm thinking to myself isn't that what turning red kind of was yeah so, like i mean yeah. i'm still curious what they do with it but like the more i think about it the more i'm just like we have turning red yeah that already deals with a teenage girl trying to find out who she is so what's yeah i mean what's inside out 2 gonna bring to the table inside out was about puberty on the interior and it turning reds about puberty on the out the exterior you know we've we've covered both bases i don't know time will tell i guess guess so we'll have to wait till 2024 Anyway, um, overall, a uh, good movie. Uh, if you like Turning Red, uh, I guess obviously check out uh, Basically Moon. every movie we mentioned yeah, in this Sailor episode. Yeah, Sailor Moon, Goofy Movie, Mitchell vs. Machines, everything ever all at once. And uh, 
I know I mentioned um Encanto, but yeah. Uh, I was I also didn't really uh, talk about it much, but yeah, Encanto. I was also reminded of that one episode of Gumball where Penny's shell cracks and her true self is revealed. I remember that. Yes. And she even goes on a rampage throughout town. Yeah, iconic. Yeah, it's probably like one of the best episodes of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Turning Red is pretty solid time. I mean, it's not going to, I understand it's not going to appeal to everyone, but I really liked yeah. it. I, like I don't know if you have like uh if someone then again like I, I this, like, so like you have a cousin in middle school or something yeah show it to them i mean i took a a, a class about like chinese history and mythology in college so a lot it of the is. stuff really was really interesting to me uh lot some people are like upset that this movie doesn't like kind of hit like every demographic but i'm gonna say i appreciate a school for uh, a movie for kids that's actually like made for kids I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes there's a lot of movies that's like, oh, this is a kid's movie, but really the target audience is like 20-year-olds with nostalgia. I guess uh, now it's my turn next week, right? It is. What do you got? Let's see. Since it is the month of horror, um, I figured, you know, obviously, I would uh, try to tap into that a bit. So I was thinking we haven't done a um, foreign language thing in uh, quite some time. I feel like usually I'm the one that brings that up in the last movie uh last three movies i did had were all you know last few movies i did were all english so i was thinking why not go dip into the wide world of uh, japanese horror because those are um pretty uh significant and um i don't know i guess like this uh us talking about like time periods and stuff kind of got me thinking of like um basically i'm recommending the horror movie uh pulse uh, I think there's, there's two versions of it, so I'm just going to uh, make sure I get the right date. But it's uh, Pulse, um, yeah, Pulse 2001, not 2006. Make sure it's the 2001 one. Directed I think by I saw Kiyoshi one for 19. Kurosawa. Yeah, there's one for 1988, too. Yeah, uh, I am. Regardless of the version, I have never heard of a movie called Pulse before. Yeah, so it's uh, Pulse is directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa, and it's basically like, um, it's one of those like horror movies that's kind of that taps into like early internet anxieties, kind of like um, Perfect Blue with serial experiments laying. Let's just say in the late '90s, early 2000s, uh, Japan really thought about all the potential horrors the internet can um, unfold. From the, I haven't seen Pulse, but from the other similar works, uh, it kind of nailed it. And uh, I've heard many good things from uh, some friends that've seen Pulse, and uh, it's been on my watch list for a while. So I figured, why not? So, um, it is, uh, I've not seen it, so I can't usually give any constant warnings like normal, but, um, it is a horror movie, so, um, expect it to be horrifying. And, um, it is kind of centered around sort of internet. Horror movie that's horrifying. What yeah. a concept. Yeah, but, uh, Pulse 2001, directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa. Um, I guess we're going from 2002 to 2001, so, uh, yeah. We're going backwards. Yes, um, and... Again, like the, it being 2001 is actually very important to the story because it is ab absolutely trying to tap into early internet anxiety. So, yeah. Um, but again, make sure you watch the 2001 version. 2006 is a like remake or something. Um, and it is widely considered to be much, much worse. Uh, I've had a few friends watch and they're like, yeah, don't, don't watch the 2006 one. Watch the 2001 one. That's the classic. Kiyoshi Kurosawa. I actually have seen some of Kiyoshi Kurosawa's work before, so uh, definitely uh, it's going to be interesting. But yeah, Pulse 2001, horror movie. All right. All right. Yeah. It's been a while since we talked about a movie that I have not – actually, no, Suburban Nights, I didn't see that. But like a movie I have, I know nothing about. Because even like your last two – last few recommendations or movies I've seen, so this is, this is going to be fun going into something completely blind. All right. So yes, Pulse next week. Yeah, and seeing uh, how seeing how we started this episode by referencing an early 2000s boy band, I think it's only appropriate to end the same way. So, <clears throat> this has been It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. Until next time, bye, 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 bye.